all work of spiritual transformation into the image of Christ, all of that work is solely the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and none of our good deeds move the dial one inch. What are spiritual disciplines and how do they help our relationship with God? And how might they actually become roadblocks to our relationship with God? And if you're new to spiritual practices, which one do you start with? In this video, Sue Russell, who is a seasoned spiritual director, she's actually a spiritual development specialist from Wycliffe for over 25 years and has led countless retreats and sat with hundreds of people and heard their prayer lives, is going to answer those questions for us. I took so many notes and this interview is full of nuggets of wisdom. So I hope you get a notepad out, save this video for later, and let's get into this interview. You have such a wealth of knowledge about spiritual practices and how they integrate into our spiritual life. And so I wanted to bring you on here just to talk about and just kind of explain spiritual direct, spiritual discipline. One, the word discipline can be a little off-putting. It's like, I don't want to have to work. What does that mean? Or is this works-based? <laughs> um, am I, is this going to be, you know, another burden that I have to have on in the Christian life when I'm already busy, overwhelmed? But could they be life-giving? And, you know, what did the church fathers maybe say about them? And so... I would just love for you to like tell like us, those of our viewers, like what are like what is what are spiritual disciplines? Okay, so these are you ask so many good questions, um, and and so many really common questions that I get when I when I talk to people. So spiritual disciplines, and I and I understand the fear of the word discipline. Um, sometimes I call them spiritual practices just to make it a little more <laughs> user friendly and not so scary. Um, but a spiritual discipline or a spiritual practice is basically just a repeated bodily action. And the doing of that actually creates a space in which the Holy Spirit can do his work. I want to make it super clear from the beginning that all work of spiritual transformation into the image of Christ, all of that work is solely the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and none of our good deeds move the dial one inch. In fact, scriptures tell us that all of our righteousness is actually filthy rags. So all of these good deeds or these good practices um, that we do don't actually form us into the image of Christ, which then begs the question, then what are we doing them for? And so the, the answer to that question is a couple of things. First of all, one of the things that, that spiritual practices do is they create good habits. You know, even though we, we are Christians, we have this new nature, uh, we don't have to sin anymore, we do actually continue to sin. We don't continue to sin because we have two natures that are battling it out. Mm -hmm. uh, we have we continue to sin even though we have this new this new nature because of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Mm -hmm. And so the world conspires against us, you know, because the world is broken. This is not the world we were intended to live in. So the world conspires against us and fights against us and makes it hard for us to to uh, to be like Jesus. The devil, of course, is actively working against us. But then there's that third piece, which is the flesh. Mm -hmm. And the flesh are these habits of body and habits of thought that we have that we have created over a long period of time and that cause us to fall into sin really easily. And so what spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices can do, they are to enable you to form a different habit. Psychologists tell us you don't break a habit, you just change a habit. So what we want to do is we want to change these habits of thought, these habits of body that are destructive and negative, and we want to do positive and good things with them. And so the, one of the things that the spiritual disciplines can actually do, like any discipline, is it actually can can help you with establishing good habits. I'm, I'm talking about things like brushing and flossing. Those are habits that we do um, because they they benefit us mm -hmm. and they cause us to be to be healthier. So yeah, you know, so I'm yeah, that's the really mundane example, but it, it follows through in the spiritual category as well. So so here we are, you know, going along in our lives and stuff. And so there's habits that we've done, and we want to create new and better habits. So that's the first thing spiritual disciplines can do. But the second thing that spiritual disciplines do is they create a space. We like to call it a sacred space. Mm -hmm. And a sacred space is just a place where God, where you're saying, God, you're welcome to work here. And I'm going to cooperate with this. I'm not going to resist you. I'm going to create a space where you're free to just do your thing. Mm -hmm. And so spiritual disciplines can help us to create that space. Mm -hmm. Did that answer most of your questions about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I like how you talk about the function that it creates, that it really creates habits. And I like that you brought up even 
brushing your teeth. So you're kind of bringing up this, this thing to tease of could spiritual disciplines be something as simple or could it, could a something, a simple task be a spiritual discipline? Yeah, this is the interesting thing. There are those classic spiritual disciplines, um, which I would refer you to, to Richard Foster's book Mm -hmm. on spiritual disciplines. Um, He kind of goes through all the classic ones, the discipline of silence and simplicity and hospitality and fasting and some of these things are these really classic spiritual disciplines but the truth of the matter is really any kind of spiritual practice um first of all let me just say there is no such thing as a secular practice versus a spiritual practice your whole life is spiritual okay Mm -hmm. so there's not some of this big divide so to answer your question about toothbrushing yes actually toothbrushing can be a spiritual discipline um anything that you do with intent uh with the lord and to create a space can be a spiritual discipline. Some things are more explicitly, I think, spiritual in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, one of my favorite books is called The Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Warren. Mm -hmm. And she really talks about this this everydayness of, uh, you know, our our lives, which are, let's face it, 99.9%, it's just regular stuff, right? It's doing the dishes and going to the grocery store and making your bed and brushing your teeth and walking the dog and all those kinds of things. And if 99% of your life is, is just that regular stuff, what a pity if that's a waste and that only 1% of your life is significant. Yeah. You know, I love the fact that only 10% of Jesus's life was ministry. Hmm. He spent the other 90% of his life just being a regular Jewish guy doing regular Jewish guy stuff. Yeah. And to me, I think if I've got 33 years, I'm not going to waste 90% of it, right? I'm going to get, well, I'm out the gate and I'm going, right? So what that says to me is that, is that that regular life is really actually really important, more important than we probably think. Yeah. And Christ really elevates it by, by that's how he spent his time, being a regular guy, doing regular guy stuff. Yeah. So, so we look at our lives and what that does is that elevates our daily lives as well mm-hmm. and says they, uh, this is actually significant. This is actually important um, that, that 90% of your life is just the regular stuff um, is actually really significant and has spiritual value. So, so the, those, those regular things, even just things mundane, like this, the rhythm and the habit of brushing your teeth, the rhythm, rhythm and habit of making your bed and those kinds of things. Those teach us things about consistency. Those teach us things about, about um, caring for ourselves, caring for our environment, caring for the resources that God has given us. Yeah. And so those actually can be, can be really significant in ways that I think we don't often think of them these spiritual practices or disciplines, right. Are habit forming. Right. And I, I would use the word, since I use like the word use word training, right. It's almost like you're, you're almost like you're coaching your body. You're, you're forming your body in a way you're moving it in a direction that is going to be hopefully positive and life giving, right. Like brushing your teeth, like reading scripture, you know, or um, being silent and still to hear the God's voice, all those things. And also at the same time, opening, when it's an opening and creating sacred space for God, I think about relating. It's almost like spiritual disciplines are a training and a way to relate to God and to yes. relate to your environment. Yes. Right. So it's kind of like with yes. a marriage, you know, if you come home and you ignore your partner and the, it's like, no, when you make someone a cup of coffee and you say, Hey, how was your day? All those things are part yes. of relating, creating space for the other yes. and training your yes. body to move towards somebody as opposed to away against or yes. something else. Yes. And yes. And yes. Yeah. This is, I think really super important because while it is always good to learn more things about God, most of us, especially Protestants, um, we know tons of stuff about God, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we believe in God, the Father, God, the Son, and the, and the Holy Bible. And so we, we really elevate God's word. Um, and it, it, it is, should be elevated and it should be important. But um, at the same time, you don't, you don't have a relationship with a person because you know stuff about them. Mm-hmm. I always like to use the example of my husband. My husband is a big fan of Winston Churchill. He really admires Winston, knows tons about Winston Churchill. He has read Manchester's three volume biography, thick biography book of Winston Churchill. He knows all kinds of stuff about him, but he has no personal relationship with Winston because he has never had an experience with him, a personal experience with him. So here we are as Protestants 
And we know tons about Jesus and tons about God. We have read the four-volume biography, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and we know tons about him. But a lot of times we don't feel like we have a relationship connection with him Mm -hmm. because even though we know stuff about him, we don't have experiences with him. Mm -hmm. And spiritual disciplines will almost always result in an experience with God. And when you have an experience with somebody, now you've got something to talk about. Yeah. With that person. Yes. Right. You've got you've got. Hey, you know, remember the other day when you and I were, were, were taking a walk together and we saw, you know, these baby birds in the nest. What was that? You know, wasn't that great? And you have a conversation and you have a shared experience. That's mm-hmm. what brings about relationship. That's one of the reasons why I, I think that spiritual disciplines are so life giving mm-hmm. uh, and not this, hor- so this dry, horrible, dead thing that we have to do. Um, but because they do result almost always in an experience with God, and that starts to build a relationship. To talk a little about like what spiritual disciplines are. So you'd picture like, what are, you kind of just touched on it, you know, what are spiritual disciplines not, or how can they maybe get us in trouble or talk about all be the negative, when we do maybe approach it as I'm being disciplined and it's maybe truncated right. or unrelational. What, tell me about what right. you think about that. Yeah, I always want to be so careful when I when I recommend a particular spiritual practice to somebody um, or suggest that this might be something for them to engage in, that I'm not just giving them another good Christian thing to do. We have lots of good Christian things to do already. Um, and, and so these are not just good Christian things to do so that you look good. Um, nobody's, nobody's getting a little gold stars here. Um, God's not going to love you more. Uh, which is a disappointment to many of us because we really think that somehow he's going to love me more if I do more good things. Um, It's not the way it works. Actually, you already have all of his love and attention that you're ever going to have. You have it all now. Nothing you do is going to make it more. Nothing you do is going to make it less, but nothing you do is going to make it more. Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing because we do have this idea that somehow God must love Mother Teresa more than other people because, you know, she just, you know, I mean, come on, it's Mother Teresa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, God doesn't work that way. In in the words of the Beatles song, you can't buy me love. Um, you can't buy God's love. You, you already have all of it you're ever going to have. So first of all, relax, because you're not earning anything here. Um, and so it's really important as we gauge, engage in these spiritual disciplines that the thing doesn't become the thing. So let's just say, for instance, the practice of, of silence. And, and and listening for God. Again, nobody is is getting little gold stars here. This practice of of, of silence and listening for God uh, is not something that makes you more Christ-like. What it does is it opens up a space mm-hmm. of quiet, right? Of of you know putting aside distractions, putting aside you know your own agenda. A lot of times people say to me, they they say. Uh, you know, in the practice of silence, for instance, one of the big, people have two big fears when they practice a silent listening with God. The first big fear is that God is not going to show up and nothing's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. The second big fear is that God is going to show up and something's going to happen, okay? <laughs> so That's usually so it's like, true. what is God going to tell me? To, yeah, what is God going to tell me to do hear. that I don't want to do? Kind of, yeah. right? Yeah, no, 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 you know, right? So, um, so let me just say, in terms of the, what if nothing happens? That's always the big thing. Because again, this is not a, this is not a, a, a practice to succeed or fail at. It's mm-hmm. just a tool. Mm-hmm. All of these are just a tool. They're not magical. They're not, you know, even particularly mystical. Uh, they're just tools. And, um, and so this is a tool that will help you and uh, to, open up this space where you can more clearly hear the still small voice, what Ignatius likes to call the subtle interior movements of the Holy Spirit, right? If you're running around and bebopping around and there's lots of noise, there's lots of input, you understand you don't feel those subtle interior movements. You don't hear that still small voice. Mm -hmm. So having this space of quiet and waiting and listening, you have to trust that in that silence, God is going to do what is best for you. So that if in that silence, it's just silent, 
it's not because you did something wrong or God's busy doing something else um, or you didn't hold your tongue just right. Um, maybe God just knew you need a little peace and quiet and this is his gift to you. Mm -hmm. Right. If what you need is, is a, is a word to come to mind or a scripture to come to mind or an image to come to mind, then you're going to get a word or a scripture or an image. Mm -hmm. If what you need is an angel to appear in the room with a message or writing on the wall, cause it's happened. <laughs> that's what God's going to give you. So you have to trust that God is going to do what is best for you in that moment. And even if, as you spend that time with him, if it is just quiet and nothing happens, you just spent a period of time in submission to God saying, this is your agenda. This is not my agenda. I am waiting on you. Do with this time as you wish. Even if nothing else happens, that just happened. And that is never a waste of time. It's almost that like is that is always the gift in the spiritual discipline. If you're using the tool I hate to say this, but right or rightly ordered, right, rightly way of using it, yes. that this is going to be helpful. Yes. You're opening up to God and that is enough yes. in of itself. And what God does and brings to that is, that is not enough. your responsibility. We let that go. Exactly. Exactly. It is not your responsibility. But it sounds like when it gets dangerous is when not dangerous, I would say unhelpful or really truncated or yeah, is when we start to use unhealthy, the spiritual, unhealthy, unhealthy is yeah. a good word. When we start to use it as I hate to say almost as God, like or that is it supposed to fix like the tool we elevate that is that that's what we need to do. And that somehow almost becomes like an idol in front of who God is. Yeah. Right. And so we, yeah, we worship the discipline and the results that we're, we're hoping and expecting to get as opposed to really God, but God is scary. Exactly. And God is not as you know, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, right? God is good. He's not safe, but he's good. And I think our souls know that not safe, so we're, he's good. Yeah. we're going to his presence and we're like, eh, what is he going to say? But he is really loving and kind. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more. You talk about the classical discipline and you just talk about silence, which is great. I love the way you experience silence. And then again, the two ways I think we can experience silence and then what might be going on in that, which I think is huge. That would be a whole nother topic in and of itself to dive into more. What are some of like, when you think of spiritual disciplines, right? Someone would Google that, right? Or you go to Richard Foster's book. What are the the things that right. like most people are were introduced to specifically so that you don't have to maybe go yeah. into all of them, but just like. No, 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 no. Yeah. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. Well, and, and, and let me just start by saying, please don't Google this. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry. That was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. But but if people Google spiritual formation or spiritual disciplines and stuff, um, it is a wild and wacky world out there in Google land. And, um, and not everything, <laughs> not everything is profitable. So you want to be really, really careful about that and make sure that you're, you're going to a, a reputable, theologically, doctrinally sound kind of source. You want to make sure when you go to, uh, to a website that it is theologically, that it is doctrinally sound. Um, there is just, there's just a lot of wackadoodle stuff out there. And so um, you want to be really careful. And I can certainly uh, at some point give some recommendations and things like that for some, some reputable things. But... If you're if you are a person that um, is just sort of just starting out on this and and just starting to learn about this and really say okay well what would be a good entry point uh, into into practices of spiritual discipline there's a reason why I mentioned the practice of silence I think that this practice of silence is is a foundational uh, spiritual discipline not only the practice itself but but it it, it feeds into almost all the other practices to some degree or another. So, so starting the, a practice of, of silence or, or um, listening for the Lord is a really, really good starting point. Let me tell you just a little bit about the practice of silence and, and again, what it is and what it isn't. So when we talk about silence or meditating, uh, contemplation, those kinds of things, um, a, lot of it, a lot of people get really concerned about the connotations with Eastern mysticism with this. And, and so I just want to say that, that when we talk about silence in, in the Christian practice, it is almost the exact opposite of, of a practice of silence and meditation in Eastern, in Eastern uh, religious thought, or even, you know, the secular uh, world thought, which usually in Eastern meditation, silence has to do with emptying yourself completely. Uh, because, you know, there's nothingness. There's, 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 there's just, there's a void. And, and you're trying to connect to this God within or trying to fly up to meet God in some sense. Um, and so it's, it's a silence of nothingness. 
Christ, the Christian practice of silence is actually quite the opposite. It is a silence that is full of God. Um, that is, it's, I would like to say silence isn't actually silent um, because you are having a conversation with God. Uh, it's just giving space for God to respond, which for a lot of us is kind of a foreign practice. I, my prayer life used to be what I think a lot of people's prayer life is, is where, you know, it'd be, dear Lord, da, 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 da. You know, I talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and prayer and praise and confession, Thanksgiving and blah, 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 and amen and go about my day. Um, if at any point God wanted to communicate something to me, at what point did he, was he able to do that, right? So now my prayer life is a lot more like, okay, so Lord, here's my day. Here's what's going on. This is maybe what's in my heart um, or something that I'm fretting about or whatever. Is there anything you want to say to me about any of this stuff? And then I shut up for a while. Hmm. Now, full disclosure for me, a while is like 10 minutes. But I shut up for a while and I just sit and I actively listen. It's not me trying to empty myself of everything. Quite the opposite. What usually happens is a flood of thoughts come in in that time of silence, some of which I can just let them go, some of which I need to jot down so that I can for, don't have to sit there and worry if I'm going to remember to get milk at the store. So I just write down milk so I can let that thought go. Or sometimes there are these thoughts that is like, I actually maybe need to talk to God about that. That's mm -hmm. why that thought keeps coming up. Maybe that's something that God wants to talk mm -hmm. with me about. Mm -hmm. So I don't get too worried about that flood of thoughts. I just keep coming back to my intention of, I want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. So as my thoughts go off down some little rabbit trail after 3.5 seconds, because that's about my attention span, um, at whatever point I realize I've wandered off down a rabbit trail, I just come back to my intention and say, hmm, no, I'm coming back now. And God, you know, one of my favorite scriptures is in 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, love does not keep an account of wrong suffered. So God is not up there with his little notebook going, oh, there she went again. Oh, there she went again. Oh, there she went again. <laughs> what he's actually doing is, oh, she's back. Yes, excellent. Oh, good. She's back again. Excellent. He's just, he doesn't. It doesn't bother him how many times you wander off. What he's paying attention to is when you come back. Yeah. So at whatever point you realize, oh, okay, I wandered off into, you know, home decor land, you know, and I need to come back. I just like, okay, let that go. Here I am again, Lord. Let's try this again. Wow. And what I will say to you is that although some people are naturally contemplative and this comes very easy to them, for the the vast majority of us, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. I just want to acknowledge that right up front. We're not used to it. We've never been trained in it. Our culture doesn't even doesn't even particularly promote it. Mm -hmm. In fact, we promote multitasking mm -hmm. and and busyness yeah. <clears throat> and achievement. So so you have to be kind to yourself and realize that this is something that you've maybe never done before or never practice consistently, I just want to urge you, first of all, to start small. Yes. I'm talking like maybe two minutes. Mm -hmm. Just start small. Set the timer on your phone for two minutes. That way you can turn off the part of your brain that's wondering how much time you have left. Mm -hmm. Set a timer for two minutes. Get yourself into a comfortable position, not so comfortable that you take a nap with Jesus. Okay, I I have done that many the time, had nap and, time, and there's nothing particularly wrong with that. And but, that's a different spiritual you know, discipline. Want, that's a different. <laughs> that's a fine nap. Right? Be with Jesus, but when you're practicing yeah, silence, be with yeah. Jesus. I've taken many a nap with Jesus for sure. But but your purpose here is not to fall asleep. So you want to be comfortable so you're not in pain, but not so comfortable that you're going to drift off. Ideally, sure. so kind of a, a straight back, comfortable chair. Put your feet on the floor. Close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths in and out, just to sort of relax yourself and and get yourself. It's kind of like if you go to the gym. You know, you put on certain clothes. You go to a certain place. You have a certain mindset. So I like to do that. That sets my intention. So I like to light a candle or maybe light some incense. So I've got a certain smell associated. I go to a certain spot. Um, and that all kind of signals me and signals my body, okay, you're going to do this now. Mm -hmm. And that just helps me to make that transition because I don't transition really well. Mm -hmm. So get into that position, get yourself all set up, and then just basically reach your Lord. Like, hi, here I am. 
Mm-hmm. You might say a few words about what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your life. And then, like I said, I just, I just usually say, so over to you, what, what would you like to say to me today? If anything, here I am, you know, your servant is listening. And, and then I just sit there and <laughs> wait on the Lord. And so just start with like a couple of minutes and, and just see how that goes and, and know that even though I don't consider myself still really like good at this, I'm definitely way better at it than when I first started out. Definitely way better. So it's one of those things that you actually will get better at if you practice, but you're not going to get better at it magically. You actually have to practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to train. Train in silence. Yeah, it is a training. Yeah. For sure is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say the practice of silence is probably the, the, the foundation level uh, spiritual discipline that you should, yeah, that's the one you want to start practicing yeah. before you get into anything. Yeah. yeah. And what would you say is the reason why it would be foundational to all the other ones? Like you mentioned hospitality, you know, community, a lot of spiritual disciplines, Lectio Divina, right? Visio Divina. How Lectio would Divina, silence... Visio Divina, the Stations of the Cross, the, yeah, uh, Walking Labyrinth, any of those kinds of things. So any spiritual discipline, almost all of them involve some level of needing to be silent. Yeah. You know, they're just, there needs, you need to have that, that space of, of silence. Um, even in hospitality, which you don't necessarily think of um, as, as a silent activity. I always think of the story of, of Mary and Martha, um, yeah. where, you know, and, and it's really important when we read that story of Mary and Martha uh, with Jesus, to, to realize that Jesus doesn't tell Martha to stop doing what she's doing. You know, she was the hostess. That was a hugely important role. And, a, and she had things that actually she had to do. This was her job. Um, and so if you're practicing hospitality, for instance, there are these, this is, there's things that are your job to do. I mean, you have, there are things, if you don't do them, they simply aren't going to happen. So here you are practicing and here she was practicing hospitality. Jesus doesn't tell her, stop doing that. What he says to her is that you are just, you are anxious about many things and you're distracted, but Mary has chosen the better part. So we think that it means action versus not action. Mm. That's not at all what it is. It's about this attitude of your heart. So what did Mary do that Martha wasn't doing? Because he says, Martha, you're distracted and you're anxious, but Mary has chosen the better part. And what she has chosen to do is to put herself in a position where she can listen to the Lord. She can hear Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the challenge then for us is how do we, in the midst of our lives, in the midst of, for instance, hospitality or any of the other things that we're doing, how do we position ourselves within that space so that we can still hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. And that requires some inner silence. Yeah. That requires some inner peace. Otherwise, we're, we're not going to hear it. So that's the challenge. So that's why silence really helps to develop that skill uh that that ability to be able to be to be quiet to be still to to tune out the distraction and the anxiety and to be able to focus on on god and listening to god so this is a challenge this is this is a very definite challenge i'm not going to sugarcoat it this is not easy to do Mm -hmm. and you really do actually have to practice it and preferably practice it consistently yeah um, and it will actually, it does actually get better. It does get easier. Mm-hmm. I'm here to tell you it gets easier. Um, yeah. but it's always going to be, I think for, I think for all of it, I think this is always going to be a challenge for most all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you made it so adaptable though, to your life, right? Getting in a chair, someone's sliding a candle. And it reminds me of um, Atomic Habits. James Clear talks about habit stacking or doing something for two minutes. It's hard, right? Like whether that's just putting on your gym shoes or whether that's driving to the gym. Like if you can do that first thing, you then become the type of person that embodies those behaviors and then it trains you. So if you become the type of person that cultivates silence for two minutes, once this week, twice next week, three times, then whatever it is, you can grow that. So it's actually, these disciplines are easy. They're hard because it's so counterintuitive, but if you break them down and you commit to them, I feel like that's the piece yeah. where they can really yeah. snowball. Snowball starts out really small, but they do compound. Like you said, it's not always easy, but it opens you up to God. This is God who we're talking about. We so desperately want him and need him. And this yeah. is the on-ramp or the entryway to do that. And this practice, like you said, touches those other ones because 
how do we know whether we're using a spiritual discipline like Lectio Divina as a way to study scripture to maybe appease God or to feel big or to whatever. If we don't start by listening and saying, okay, Lord, what spiritual mm-hmm. practice should I do in this season of my life? Let's yeah. take Lent. Yeah. Should I, do I embark on fasting? Should I actually let something go? Or am I just doing it because my church is doing it? My pastor's doing it. Do Is this really what I need to do? Well, if I get quiet, this is spiritual practice of, of being attentive to God. I love that. Yep. Yep. I love that. Yep. Um, exactly. Awesome. So, yeah. Wow. And by the way, yeah, we'll link below, um, I think, a reference to the spiritual disciplines and maybe some resources too down in the description. That'll be real helpful for people mm-hmm. if they're wanting to start like researching more about what spiritual practices are. One of the great things that we have right now is we have basically 2,000 years worth of ways in which the Holy Spirit has interacted with people. We have like a smorgasbord of of these different tools and these different ways and means. And one of the things that I really love to do is to be able to introduce people to these different kinds of things. And some things work for you for a while. I pick things up, use them for a while, put them down, pick something else up. You know, it, it, I think it's one of, one of the great benefits we have at this stage in history is we've got a lot to pull from. Yeah. Uh, and different things work for different kinds of people. Yeah. And so there you go. You just bring up a really good point. So what are some of the signs that a spiritual practice stops doing what it's supposed to, if you will? When does it stop bringing you to God? What are some of the signs that people can look for? So that's a really good question. Um, I think for me, when it starts to become kind of too rote Mm -hmm. so that I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing, um, I have to be really careful about that. Um, There's kind of a balance between disciplining yourself to not be bored too easily. You know, we do have generally fairly short attention spans these days. Um, and, and one of the things that something like the discipline of making your bed or brushing your teeth every day will do is it helps you to learn the value of repetition Mm -hmm. and, and to be content with repetition. Um, and so, so there is just sort of an aspect of, yeah, you just want to be, you know, um, repetition is important and learning how to be repetitious and learning how to be bored, if you will. But sometimes things just start to, I don't know, just, uh, they just don't seem as life-giving to me. I, I'm not even sure how really to describe it. Um, also, you ha- you want to be careful and, and watch yourself again that you're not um, you're not doing this because it looks good or because it, even because it looks good to you, yeah. and that you start doing it just because you know it's a good Christian thing to do. And and I you know I want to you know I want to look like a good Christian and stuff. So sometimes the disciplines. And these things that we do, instead of bringing us closer to God, actually can kind of hold God at bay Mm -hmm. because we're so busy doing this thing out here that I don't actually have to engage with God in here. So when I find myself starting to just do the thing, but I'm not really engaging with God, um, I start to think maybe it's time to to put that down and and try something else. And then just sometimes for me, it isn't even just that something that I went off of something, but just that something else looked really interesting to me and really appealed to me. Um, and part of that kind of just follow the liturgical calendar a little bit. So, you know, I do certain practices at Lent. I do certain practices during Advent. I do certain practices during these different seasons. Um, and so that helps to keep them from getting stale yeah. uh, and, and doing that. Um, or like I said, sometimes I'll just be reminded of, oh, yeah, I haven't done, I haven't done a Visio Divina in a really long time you know, or I find myself recommending a practice to somebody else that I haven't actually done in ages. Yeah. Like maybe I should get pick that up again and just see how it's going, <laughs> you know? So, um, so you, I, you always want to be careful. Like I said earlier, whenever I, I recommend a practice to someone, I always want to make sure that they really clearly understand what it's for and what it's not for. Yeah. And even like in the practice of silence, even if it doesn't seem like anything is is happening, you're getting any benefit in the moment. A lot of times the, the benefit comes because you're doing it, not when you're doing it, hmm. if that makes sense. That's very good. Uh, and you'll very just good. find like, for instance, there's a practice called the examine, which is a thing you do at the end of the end of the day. I find that when I'm practicing the examine, my whole day, I think differently. And, and, and my heart is different because I know at the end of the day, this practice is coming. 
So I'm more intentional and paying more attention to things during the day so that I do have something to talk about with God during the exam and, uh, as I go back. So it, I just, it, it makes me more conscious and more there. Um, so a lot of times it's not so much the practice itself, but what the practice kind of does for you uh, in the general part of your life. So I think you just have to be, you have to pay attention to yourself uh, and what your motivations are and why you're doing what you're doing. And yeah, no, don't be afraid to keep going, even if it seems boring, but also don't be afraid to say, okay, that's enough for now. Let me try something else. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you painted so beautifully a picture as that the result is to be with God. And this is something that I've actually seen in, in, in spiritual direction is, you know, and some people might fall off their chairs right now if they've gotten this far in the video, but I've actually encouraged people to maybe put their Bible down for a little bit or church is super triggering because something happened. So maybe not the discipline of going to church and worshiping communally is something you can put aside. You think, oh my gosh, well, that is, but did Jesus go to church every single Sunday and crack open the Torah? Maybe not, you know, but what did, was he in God's presence? Yeah. And so it's, I think you said to the word, um, you know, listening to this Ignatian, listening to the internal movements of your heart. Where's this discipline taking me? Is it so painful and so broke and so boring that I'm actually banging my head against the wall and I'm just doing this because I feel like I'm pleasing God or trying to do the good Christian thing? It's really, again, where's our attitude? Right. Yeah. Right. And so that's. Yeah, true. I did actually recommend to one of my directees that she stop going to church for a month. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a, yeah. For that, yeah. exactly what you're yeah. talking about. If it's yeah. not. The discipline is serving you well if it is bringing you closer into a relationship with God. To the degree that it's doing that, it's a good discipline for you. To the yeah. degree that it's not, it's not. A, it may be a good discipline, but it may not be a good discipline for you. Yes, absolutely. It's not a one size fits all. Just because your pastor is the way your pastor, you know, has his quiet time with his cross out. I remember getting watching, listening to a whole sermon where this goes. This is how I hear it from God, and it was like. Well, but there's a bunch of ways and a bunch of things to do. I don't, I'm not analytical like you. So what, you know, so that's really important to do this. And I think I would also just like, I don't know we're going to wrap up here, but um, if anyone's, if everyone wants to do it, I think doing it with another person, you want a spiritual practice and you're not sure how to integrate that into your life. Having a spiritual director, someone who's done spiritual practices to kind of help you maybe choose and discern which one would be for you. That's also a really good, um, and that's been helpful for me. Yeah. And Sue, both Sue and I are actually spiritual directors. So I know I would be happy to meet with anybody too. If you want to know more about spiritual practices and how to start implementing them into your life, then check out this playlist where I have a ton of spiritual practices and how to do them and integrate them into your prayer life. Thanks so much. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.